Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we are changing the mental health narrative, bringing hope and solutions. Here's your host, Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. Cedric Bertelli is a recognized expert in emotional resolution, known as MRES. This is a revolutionary approach to emotional healing that has transformed the lives of countless individuals. As the founder and director of the Emotional Health Institute, EHI, Cedric has dedicated his career to helping people overcome stress, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other negative emotions using powerful tools and techniques. Well, Cedric, welcome. Thank you for joining me today. Hello, Tim. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I was hoping you could start us off by letting us know about how you got into the work you do and what drives your passion for it. Sure. So um, this is a second career for me. The first career, for my first career, I was working in uh, hospitality business. I was working for the Ritz Carlton Hotel. Uh, I was first a chef and then uh, a director of restaurants up until 2009. And during this period of time, uh, personally, I was struggling with uh, a lot of anxieties and uh, self-directed anger, a lot of this. And also working with a lot of uh, a lot of employees, I could see how emotions were what you needed to manage in a company and not so, so much people. Uh, anyway, emotions always have been uh, uh, um, an interest of mine in 2009. I decided to change career to go back to France and to study therapy and how to resolve or how to regulate emotional difficulties using uh, the body. Um, I studied in France from 2000 and 2011 and then came back in the US, kept on uh, my kept on my studies and uh, turned into neuroscience and uh, uh, practiced a lot with uh, um, clients. And in 2019, uh, we created the Emotional Health Institute in collaboration with uh, Dr. Jacques Fumex in France and developed a body of work called EMRES, E-M-R-E-S, or Emotional Resolution, uh, that uh, aimed to support people to resolve disruptive emotional patterns based on what we understand uh, on the neuroscience of emotions and uh, and our um, our experience. And so, you mentioned another doctor who was in France. What was his specialty? Mm-hmm. So, Doctor Jack Fumex is a gastroenterologist. I hope I said that okay. He is now uh, retired, and uh, his specificity was that when GI issues had no biological root, we would say, he was using hypnosis to help people, to um, to support people in their healing. And hypnosis was working sometimes, but not as much as he wishes or he wished. So he, uh, he started thinking about what all the ways we could use to help uh, his patients. And we met uh, studying uh, somatic therapy and little by little we started collaborating and noticing the importance of physical sensations when it comes to emotional responses. And together we worked and designed the emotional resolution process, which is, it's not really a process, it's not really a thing, it's really a body of work that encompasses a lot of things, but it's mostly based on the natural capacity that the body has to resolve disruptive emotional pattern, to, uh, I would say, heal the wounds created by trauma. And so it grew out of your experience with somatic therapy. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and sorry, and the understanding uh, that we have today, especially for Lisa Fenman Barrett and Antonio Damasio, but also Joseph Ledoux and Bruce McEwen, of how the brain construct, uh, construct emotions. So if you can go through those names a little more slowly. Sure. Absolutely. So for me, the main one is Lisa Feldman Barrett out of Boston. The second one is Antonio Damasio, uh, Bruce McEwen for neuroplasticity, 
and uh, Joseph Ledoux out of NYU. These were kind of like the, the, the foundation in the neuroscience of emotion and that we find inspiration with, among others, of course. So if you would just take us back to what did you get most? What, what did you think was the most impactful that you got out of studying somatic therapy? I think what was most impactful was what we noticed during somatic therapy and what we understand is the neuroscience of emotion. Um, if I can spend two minutes on that, would that be okay? Sure. What we, uh, what we understand today about emotional difficulties is that at the origin of every single one of our disruptive emotional pattern, we have the same type of event, which is what we can call a traumatic event. What is a traumatic event? Uh, in my book, at least, the traumatic event is an instant that holds too much stress for us to take on at the instant when we live it. Stress can be emotional stress or physical stress. When the stress is too much for us to take on when we experience it, there is a natural phenomenon that's happening in us that we're going to call dissociation. Basically, the prefrontal cortex become inhibited so we don't suffer too much during this instant of trauma. When this is happening, when the dissociation happens, the subconscious mind, so to speak, takes over. Now, the way that the subconscious mind deal, gather information is very different from what consciously we are aware of. For example, you and I right now, we are aware of about 2,000 bits of information per second. And we manage that at a speed of about 150 miles per hour. These are numbers from the Penn University from 2012, I believe. At the same time, the potential of the subconscious mind is much greater. The subconscious mind can gather about 400 billion bits of information per second and can process them at a speed of about 150,000 miles per hour. So when there is dissociation, because of too much stress, the subconscious is gathering all the information available through an, our environment, through our five senses, what we smell, what we hear, etc., and also the physical sensations that we feel in our body, or we can call interoception. Something that we need to know about the brain is that one of the main, one of the main, or the many main function of the brain is to predict. Our brain constantly predict based on past events. We can see that with food, for example. If we have our first, let's say, Granny Smith apple, when we are maybe four years old, we're first having a sensorial experience. We buy the apple, we have the acidity, uh, the juiciness. We have a sensorial experience. And if we have, when we have a second Granny Smith apple, right before we buy this apple, our body is generating the same sensations that we're about to feel. We don't even have to buy this apple anymore. We know exactly the experience we're about to live. Our brain is predicting this experience. It is the same thing about emotion. When our body is exposed to an element that it recognized was present during a past trauma, our body is going to generate a prediction, is going to predict what physical sensation we are about to feel in our body based on what was felt during a specific trauma. These physical sensations are generated just like with the apple earlier. These physical sensations that we call interoception is what lets us know that we are feeling an emotion. What we understand is that this prediction, when we experience it as human beings, we never let it play out until the end. We always control. We control how we feel, we shut it down, we breathe into it, or we control our environment so that this prediction can stop. And that is the problem. In a nutshell, what we put our finger on is, if we can experience the whole prediction, the sensorial prediction, without any interference from our mind or our body, just feeling the whole prediction in our body, in a safe environment, at the end of the prediction, the body is expecting to be hit with some kind of danger, some kind of stressor. During a session, at the end of the prediction, nothing happens. 
at that very instant, the prediction is updated. What used to create the sensorial prediction will not create any prediction anymore. So in a nutshell, and then I shut up, in a nutshell, uh, what emotional resolution is doing is updating outdated prediction. So we can experience the emotions that are held by our current reality instead of reacting from past wounds, past experience that were not integrated. You're breaking the cycle of predicting and then ab reacting or shutting down that got initiated at any point in my life where I experienced something that I decided was too much for me. And this process of, you called it dissociation happens. There's this automatic process within the mind at a subconscious level that tries to prevent me from getting that hit or punch at the end that I did the first time, whenever the trauma was originated. And you yes. break that cycle of prediction and then the physiological response of tension and upset and manufacture of the symptoms or the signals of the emotion that just automatically kick in whenever any part of the original trauma gets experienced by my senses. It's absolutely correct, yeah, absolutely correct, yeah. yeah. The dissociation, just I want to make sure that, that I understood you correctly, the dissociation happened at the moment of the trauma. But when we are, when we are facing a, an everyday stimulus, sometimes there is dissociation. Yes, it depends. It depends on the person. It's always this. But the original dissociation, at least from what we can see, what we can observe, happen at the moment of the trauma. Yeah, which is why um, this can help break that cycle because it's yeah. I'm on, you know, so much of what I think and do and experience is on autopilot. Because as Absolutely. you said, the conscious part of my mind is tiny compared to what the subconscious or unconscious is processing constantly. Correct. Absolutely. And, 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 I at, do add and at, at the level of functioning in the world, mostly I experience that as a really good thing because it would be very time consuming if every time I went to drive a car, I had to relearn how to drive the car. So it's great that I do a lot of things automatically. But here are these maladaptive patterns that I've downloaded whenever I had a trauma experience, and they also get triggered and start to run automatically, and they aren't so useful. Absolutely correct. Yes. And so something like emotional resolution and the process that you're using to help people with a combination of the somatic experiencing and your knowledge of the neuroprocessing that you help people have a safe environment within which to go through that prediction process fully and breathe through it. Oh, you just know, one thing. Not breathe go through ahead. It. Go ahead. It's so key. What you said here is is it's absolutely exact. And the only bemoan that uh, that I have to add because it's such a common uh, misstep is to breathe into it. Like we don't want to breathe into it. If you breathe into an emotion, you are taking control over the emotion. And in this case, the body thinks that, well, if he's taking control, that must mean that there is actual, a actually a danger around me. That's the main thing. When we feel the sensation, it's so important to not breathe into it, to not stretch, to not have a glass of water, but to let the prediction plays out without any kind of interference from us or from, uh, let's say, a therapist. So it, it puts me in mind of this step number three or commitment number three from the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership. And that says, I commit to feeling my feelings all the way through to completion. They come, I locate them in my body, I move, I breathe, and vocalize them so they release all the way through. It's not about controlling it. It's about experiencing it fully. A hundred percent. 
a hundred percent. However, and I'm sorry to insist, but, but please I do be we, no, please do. We want to, we want you to be precise and figure out what there might be a difference between your approach and these other approaches. Yes, yes, uh, especially because I hope people will try it after listening to us, and they don't have to believe me. They have to experience it. They have to try it. Uh, when we voice, when we breathe into it, when we move, we we feel like we express our emotion. It's not really the case. It's a way, for example, if I'm angry and I'm screaming, I'm releasing tension. If I'm tense and I start moving or dancing or whatever is my practice, I release tension. And that, that prevents the resolution to happen. It's important that it happen within self. And yes, at times it might be uncomfortable to be with the sensations as they process, but they never last long. They never last longer than 90 seconds, nine zero. During a session, with, when we do it on ourselves, during a session with a therapist, uh, in, in a session by the book, the release of a specific prediction will take up to three minutes, not much more. But it is key to not breathe, to not move your body, but to feel the sensation within the body as they change within you. This way you do not regulate you resolve uh, that I make a difference between that. We have a lot of coping mechanism or technique to regulate emotion. But often when we are um, faced by a similar, similar situation, the emotion is gonna come back again and we're gonna have to regulate again. So we become in control of our emotion, yes. But uh, the goal of MRS is to really resolve whatever can be resolved. And the actual resolution comes as you're describing it, by allowing the process to unfold and then without any coping mechanism on my part, I experience that there isn't the overwhelm, there isn't the hit that you talk about. And that breaks the cycle of me thinking I need at that subconscious level that I need to do this prediction and brace for this big impact when there isn't going to be one. It is absolutely correct. I mean, in our life, we update prediction constantly. Uh, I give you an example. Um, let's say there's new a new ice cream shop opening down the street, and I decide to go there for to have a, to have an ice cream. Uh, it's a new place, so there is a lot of batches, but there's no, no label. So there is a pink batch, uh, a green batch, a brown batch, whatever. And I love strawberry ice cream, so. I decide to have some of the, the pink batch and I ask for one bowl of the pink uh, the pink ice cream. The person gave it to me. I come out of the store. I expect to have some kind of fruity flavor, strawberry, raspberry. I take a little spoon, I eat it, and whoa, it tastes like smoked salmon. This is actually smoked salmon ice cream. How many spoon of smoked salmon ice cream do you, need, do you think I need to know that in this store, the pink batch is smoked salmon? One, one little taste. And until I'm proved wrong by this store, I will know that not in all the stores on earth, but in this specific store, the pink batch, it's salmon ice cream. And it's going to inform my whole experience. That means that if I go in a store, in an ice cream store in the future, and there is no labels, because of what happened to me, I will ask the person behind the counter, what are the flavors? So. I updated my prediction specifically from this store, for this store, in about two seconds, forever. And I learned from this experience that I can apply in any, uh, in any other stores in my life. The difference being that between that and a trauma situation is that that updating the prediction you're doing is happening at the conscious level. It happened at the conscious and subconscious level because I was not exposed to stress. Right, okay. right. So you're, the idea is that when we have a trauma, it something is happening within the brain at the conscious, unconscious level that the unconscious decides I need to take over because the conscious part of me decided I can't handle this. That's right. It's too much stress. I'm going to disconnect so the person... so. He doesn't suffer too much or she doesn't suffer too much. In that process that you're calling disconnection or dissociation. And then whenever the unconscious gets aware of those signs or symptoms or signals that 
resonate the same frequencies or smells or sounds as the original trauma, that unconscious process kicks in without any updating. That's right. Boom. Just like it happened maybe 30 years ago, 10 years ago, or wherever, whenever the trauma happened, which can be at birth. You know? So some people say without integrating it, you say without updating it, right? The idea yeah. is I'm on a rote repetition pattern that's been triggered without my conscious awareness. Correct. And uh, people who say integrating, I could totally agree with them. It's an integration. I think what we do with MRES is allowing ourselves and the people we work with to integrate all parts of our life. It's a bit like this moment of dissociation of parts of our life that have been stolen from us. We, dis we, we disappear during these few seconds. During MRES is reconnecting, reconnecting, reintegrating all these parts of life that were stolen uh, from us by life events. So we can live our life, I like to say, from the epicenter of our life with all our experiences. And living from the epicenter, how would you... Put some more words on that to describe that. For me, living from the epicenter means to accept, accept all, all of ourselves. That means that um, living from the epicenter of our life, that means that we are really experiencing in our body what is congruent to a current reality. So what that is congruent that... to a current reality? Yes. For example, if I if I meet you, Tim, and I don't know anything about you, but when I when I come toward you, I feel I feel tense right away. I have no no particular reason, but maybe it's because uh, I don't know because of your smell that I don't even smell consciously, or maybe your size because you're taller than me and I was bullied in the bus when I was when I was a child or, or something. There's there's something about you that that make me tense and make me feel anxious to be around you. That's not congruent with my current reality. I will not even take the time for, to see if we can be friends, if we can have a relationship. That's not congruent. I have something happening in me that come from the past. So basically there's a part of me that is moved back to whatever trauma might have happened 20, 30 years ago. What, what I mean by being congruent with our current reality is I come toward you, I feel relaxed just like I'm now and we can have a conversation. And I can be informed with what's, what is actually happening now, not because of something that, that happened in the past. Okay, and I was so, not integrated. So if you meet me on the street and you mm -hmm. have this discomfort, mm -hmm. does that mean that in that moment you are not living from your epicenter? Often, that's true. Often, when I meet you in the street and I don't know anything about you and I feel tense, chances are there's a part of me that went back to an instant of trauma. There is something about you, your shape, smell, something that you say, the way you move even maybe, that move, get my body to, from the episode of my life, I went to maybe 20 years ago. So I have one foot here and now with you and one foot, you know, uh, 30 years ago, let's say. Exactly. And so how do you then live from the epicenter when that happens? So when that happens, uh, if we, we first, I would have to feel safe, right? So let's say I met you and have this thing and okay, we finish the conversation. You, you, I go away or you go away and I still feel this tension in me, this anxiety. What I would have to do in a very pragmatic uh, way is I would have to make sure that I'm in a space where I feel safe and I will close my eyes. That would allow me to see if I'm safe. If, if I'm having a hard time closing my eyes, that means that my body doesn't feel safe. I can explain that later. But as I feel the anxiety, I, I close my eyes, I'm okay to close my eyes, and I'm gonna pay attention to sensations in my body. I'm gonna pay attention to two sensations at once. It's important. Two sensations that make me uh, uh, realize that I was anxious. Huh? So maybe my throat is tight and, and my heart is beating. And also my, my plexus system. So I'm gonna pay attention to these sensations. As I pay attention to my sensations, I'm not in any kind of story about you or about why did I feel this way? No, no, I'm just intimate with my, with my emotion. We're really intimate with our emotion. Usually we surf upon some kind of emotional wave. When you stop and you just feel the sensations, you're intimate with your emotion, with your anxiety. So I feel these two or three sensations. And at this point come the most difficult. 
I've got to do nothing. And how do I do nothing? I just pay attention to what's happening within me as the sensations start to change. The sensations are not going to stay static. They are going to transform, to move, to become more intense or less. They're going to move. They're going to do things. They're going to change because that's a transformation of sensation. My only job now is to feel the sensations as they change within me. That will stay. That will take between a few seconds and 90 seconds. At the end of the transformation of the sensations, I will feel a sense of normalcy, a sense of calm. At this point, I can open my eyes. Next time I will meet you, I will not feel anxious. It is extremely simple, but it is what's happening in nature everywhere for mammals. You know, we always talk about the impala being chased by the lion and it's, it's the same principle. It's just letting the time, leaving the time for the body to process a sensorial prediction. That's all it is about. And it is so simple that it's very difficult to communicate about it. Well, especially because we're so trained to rely on the internal processing that thinks, okay, now what do I do? I want to be doing something to accomplish a change. And what you're talking about is that sitting with it allows it to resolve itself. That's correct. And so also you don't want to judge yourself, right? A lot of time we feel uh, I'm anxious, so I'm weak. So I judge myself. So I don't want even to look into it. No, 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 no. It's all not about judging. Is it weak? No, no. It's, it's completely irrelevant. We feel in a funk and there's no real reason for that. Huh? Then we stop and we become intimate with this funk. I follow the sensations and you be with it, even if it's uncomfortable, because one of the reasons why we put all those coping mechanisms into place is because the sensations are going to be a bit uncomfortable. Yeah. But so what? We feel the sensations anywhere in our life. We just decide to shut them up, to shut them down, or to uh, um, to inhibit them. Say that last word again, or to what? Um, to inhibit them, to uh, to them, for example, with breathing or with alcohol or with marijuana or something else. So instead of soothing them, we just allow them and observe them. That's correct. For me, uh, it's uh, it's the the hero journey, right? It's uh, all those all those emotions that keeps on coming back in our life. They're like dragons. And we spend our life the way fighting our dragons, escaping our dragons, trying to control our dragons. That doesn't work. The dragons will keep on coming back. If we want to play the dragons, if we want to slay our old dragons, what we have to do is to let ourselves be swallowed by them. Completely feel this emotion. When we're swallowed by them, when we feel the sensation, basically we, we go at the, at the core of our emotion. From there, we can slay the dragons once and for all. But it does take, would I want to say courage? Yeah, it does take an amount of courage to get in the sensation, getting the emotions until, until they uh, naturally process. And that's why often a coach, a therapist, and helper is necessary because uh, you can, or the practitioner can create a safe environment and uh, can give a light guidance for the person to go inside, inside the emotion until the end of the prediction. And at the end, it's never what we had feared. Never. And this is the thing that so many of these techniques help us see that we can't see unless we just stay there and watch it and see it That's right. and trust. Because as long as we're running from the monster, we're convinced that it's too big for us to defeat. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And sometimes, often, it feels too big for us. Especially, you especially know. Especially to that part of us that decided it was too much to begin with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and if I... if um, so with, with MRS, we never work on a traumatic event. Uh, if, a, if a trauma happened and the person knew what the trauma was, we're never going to work through it because there is no point in going into a traumatic event. The traumatic event happened. Uh, there's nothing we can do about it. No. What emotional resolution do, does is to resolve the wound, the impact that this trauma created in our life. That is that energetic 
you know, auto response that you're. Yeah, that's right. That that repetition of the prediction cycle that's getting repeated. That's what you interrupt. That's correct. And, and I, I will also say that there is often a, mis, uh, a misconception about trauma. Let's say I'm, I'm being uh, uh, sexually abused. If I'm being sexually abused for, let's say, five minutes, during those five minutes, I'm not going to have only one dissociation. Chances are I'm going to have several of them because the stress is going to be so intense for so long. For each dissociation, that will create probably an impactful uh, disruptive emotional pattern in my life. So when people know the trauma, one of the first questions a practitioner asks is, what do you see today being the impact, plural, of this trauma in your life today? And we go down the list of the different impacts that can be multiple. And then the point you're making is, and then do you work on those impacts? Correct, each one of them. And we resolve them. It's rather than less, rather yeah. than trying to uh, list in great detail what was the original trauma, you focus on what's the impact today. Absolutely. We do not focus on the original trauma as little as we can, because as, as I said earlier, it happened and there's nothing we can do about it. Now, if we look at our life today, today in my life, what is the problematic? What is what are the issues? What makes me suffer today? And we go, we, we take the person, it's a bit like having a big cake, right? This trauma is this huge cake that we were not able to swallow, that we will never be too able to swallow, so to speak. Well, let's see how this cake is, is, uh, is impacting us today. And let's see each slice of it. And we're going to support the client or the client is going to support themselves, resolving each piece of the cake at the time. As, as a present moment, physiological experience not as a memory of the past exactly Diedrich Wolzak in his work focuses on what did I make that mean because I can't go back and change what happened in the past but if it gets resonated in my awareness today the meaning i gave that that happened to me is active in me today and if i change that meaning i get resolution it's it's one of the things that we work with mrs as well right. what does that say about me that i feel that i feel that for for each one of those impacts so to speak for each one of those wounds that i carry today there is a thorough work that we're doing uh, about self image about of course the emotion felt today so it's um, yeah, it's a complete it's a it's a complete work for each piece of the the today impact. So, what's the format that you use for working with people? Do they have to be in person with you? Do you use um, you know distance video te telehealth? What what format are you working with? So um, each practitioner is different. Um, you know, we train several practitioners. Each practitioner is different. Myself, uh, since the pandemic, I let go of my office. Uh, first, I didn't know what would be the result on video compared to in person. And they're actually better. And the reason is when the client is working from an environment that they know, they actually feel safer. So they don't have to meet me, come to my office or anything like that. I, uh, my request to the client is be in a place where you feel safe. That means that um, to, the, to the point, to the extent that if somebody comes to work on, on an emotion that uh, uh, is held in the house, for example, I ask them to get out of the house and to be in their car in the forest or wherever they want, but in a place where the body feels safe. So to answer your question, I, I do my sessions exclusively via, uh, via video, via Zoom. Uh, and it works. It works exceptionally well. Um, and how do I work? We do, uh, we do sessions on one-on-one -on -one, and I teach my clients how to do the work on themselves by themselves. So in between sessions, they have the ability to take care of themselves. So they don't rely on me so much. And you mentioned that you trained others. So if somebody wanted to experience this, how should they contact you? So uh, if they want to contact me, they can go to my personal website, which is cedricbertelli.com. 
And if they want to learn more about this work, they can, they can go on our main website, which is emotionalhealthinstitute.org. Emotionalhealthinstitute.org. And we'll have that, the rest of it, and your name, you know, cedricbertelli.com, um, in the notes where people can access it. So if you would, Thank before you. before we move too, too far uh, up against the deadline that I have for time here, if you would just clear your thoughts for a minute and think, okay, so based on whatever we've said so far, what's something that we even haven't asked you at all about related to your work or what you would like people to know or something we've already talked about that you want to highlight before we wrap up? Two things I would say. say. Number one is if one learns to do the process on themselves, that takes about, I would say, two hours to really understand how to do it on yourself and why you do things this way. You can reach a great autonomy in your emotional health forever. So it's very worth to spend an hour and a half to two hours to learn how to do this work on oneself. And for that, we provide um, free or, or very low um, uh, cost, I think the $8 trainings every month. So people can learn how to do that on themselves by themselves. And the second thing is our main emotions, our main anxieties, our main uh, uh, anger or such, uh, I see them as symptoms almost. A bit like if you have the flu, if you have the flu, you have a fever. So you're very much aware of the fever. You, you're, you're cold and you, your skin feels strange. So that's a symptom. The fever is a symptom. If you treat the fever, the flu is not gonna go away. What, what I found is those big emotions that we are aware of, it's a bit like a symptom. Um, often working with a practitioner, you're gonna go into the big anxiety or the big anger and that's going to be, so to speak, the symptom, but that's going to allow the practitioner to go with you, so for us to go together and find uh, hidden emotions, hidden fears that we are not aware of. We're not aware of them because these emotions that we're going to encounter during a session don't have a name. In our life, they're lived as tensions. We, we have a lot of emotions in us human beings that we do not have a label for, and they just felt as tensions. A lot of these tensions have dramatic impact in our life and relationships. So during a session, we tap into those big emotions and the clients came to see us for, and we go and find as many tensions as we can and resolve them as well. So, uh, so the person is uh, as um, how can I say that um, positively impacted as possible. So the, the 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 power of tensions that we feel in our life is great. So the two points you wanted to make are that it takes an hour and a half or two hours to learn how to do this for myself. Correct. And you have monthly, you have video trainings at a very low cost where someone can learn that process for themselves. Correct. And the second thing that you were making as a point is that the pattern that you've seen with a lot of therapies and therapists is that they go after the big intense emotions and what you've discovered is that that's really more like a symptom of this other more complex set of tensions within the body and if people can learn those more subtle tensions and do this process with those they get resolution at a deeper level is that what you were saying that's absolutely correct yes wonderful so if people wanted to tap into those trainings, is that um, the Emotional Resolution Institute? Yep. Correct. The Emotional Health Institute. EmotionalHealthInstitute.org? Uh, that's right. Or they can go on my website. They're listed on both, uh, on both sites. Excellent. Well, I greatly appreciate your taking time to share with our audience. And uh, I look forward to trying this work out myself and uh, seeing what, what benefits I get from it. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time, your questions, and uh, and this this woman spent together. Thank you, well, Tim. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Thanks, thanks for agreeing to do this. My pleasure. Cedric Bertelli is a recognized expert in emotional resolution, known as MRES. This is a revolutionary approach to emotional healing 
that has transformed the lives of countless individuals. As the founder and director of the Emotional Health Institute, EHI, Cedric has dedicated his career to helping people overcome stress, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and other negative emotions using powerful tools and techniques. After a drastic career change, Cedric began his journey into emotional resolution in 2009 in his home country of France. Since then, he has honed his expertise and developed a deep understanding of how emotions function in the human psyche. His work has touched the lives of people all over the world. At EHI, Cedric and his team provide training and education to mental health professionals, coaches, and educators, helping them to integrate emotional resolution into their practices. In addition, Cedric works directly with clients, providing individualized support and guidance to help them overcome emotional challenges and improve their overall well-being. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.